Okay, Ling 201, we've got one more uh, lecture on syntax to work through today. Uh, this one is about transformations and what better way to symbolize transformations with than with Yoda. Uh, and so with that in mind, uh, I'll point out that the um, quick write you should do before this one is the one about uh, Yoda, how he speaks in the good old fashioned Star Wars movies, uh, The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Uh, so try to answer the questions there before um, watching this lecture, or maybe you can do it just as you're doing this so you can kind of keep up. But we're going to talk about Yoda a little bit today. I also want to talk a little bit about an earlier quick write we, that we did for a couple lectures ago. Um, so this is the one about Jack and Jill uh, running up the hill or running up the bill. Uh, so um, if you haven't done this one already, you should probably do it. Uh, before I walk through this description or explanation as well, because um, I kind of want to go into the details before it's too late. So uh, these are some sample quick writes from previous year's classes uh, that I'll just um, display to you because I think they kind of help explain what I'm trying to get at with this. Uh, but um, this person went through and kind of identified the uh, sentences which I uh, interpret as ungrammatical and which I hope you would too. So number two and number six are kind of the un uh, problematic ones. So Jack and you can say Jack and Jill ran up the hill, but you can't say Jack and Jill ran the hill up. Um, you can, however, say Jack and Jill ran the bill up, but you can't say up the bill ran Jack and Jill. Uh, so this person kind of had doubts about number four. It looked like they wanted to uh, say maybe that was bad, but Jack and Jill ran up the bill, that's okay. Uh, and then number five has this uh, kind of interesting and important question mark where they say, I've always been told that ending up in a, a sentence in a preposition is bad. And we've all heard that, uh, hopefully, or not hopefully, but probably um, in our high school English classes or wherever, right? Um, what's wrong about ending a sentence in a preposition? Well, as a matter of fact, English does it a lot. And what we're going to see uh, if we walk through this carefully is that the up that we see in this sentence is not actually the same up that we see in number two. So Jack and Jill ran the hill up is bad, uh, but Jack and Jill ran the bill up is something that people will actually say on a regular basis. Uh, so I've got some other kind of fun um, quick right answers here. So this person had uh, a member of the grammar police saying stop with number five, I guess. Um, and then this little graphic of Jack and Jill running up a hill. Uh, and this person had uh, two people, Jack and Jill again, running up a bill at a bar or whatever, uh, or a restaurant perhaps, totaling like $1,000. Uh, and then saying running the hill up doesn't make much sense because uh, you can't take a hill and run it up in the same way that you run a bill up, right? So there's two different expressions going on here. One is uh, kind of a literal expression of running up a hill, and the other is a figurative expression of running a bill up where you don't actually move the bill in any particular way. Um, so these are the combinations I mentioned before, uh, which are kind of crucial to understanding what's going on here. You can't say this one, but you can say Jack and Jill ran the bill up. And then interestingly, you can move up the hill to the beginning of the sentence, up the hill ran Jack and Jill, but you can't do that with up the bill. Uh, so this person said it's hard to explain. It just doesn't sound right to say ran the hill up or up the bill ran. I think maybe an important difference is that a hill is a physical place, whereas a bill is more of an idea. Or, uh, the meaning of ran also changes between the two. So actually this is kind of what's going to be crucial here is the verb more than um, the type of noun that we're dealing with here because both hill and bill are nouns. Um, this person kind of was getting at the crucial matter here. So this person says the change in words changes the meaning of the sentence. So will some things, so some things will make sense with the word hill when they don't with the word bill and vice versa. However, the type of word does not change as both bill and hill are nouns. Correct. What changes is the phrases you put the words together in different phrases when you switch the nouns. And so they kind of um, divvied this up correctly and recognize that up the hill is an entire prepositional phrase or this is a preposition. But for running up a bill, uh, the bill is off by itself. It's a noun phrase and run up is actually a special kind of verb. Um, even though it's kind of split up into two words, which is a weird aspect of English and um, maybe some other Germanic languages. So uh, it's okay to move an entire PP like this prepositional phrase. It works as a constituent in the sentence. So you can move that whole thing up to the front of the sentence and then like in up the hill around Jack and Jill, but you um, can't just have the preposition be at the end of the sentence. So the preposition needs to have this noun phrase complement. Uh, in the previous lecture, I said, uh, heads of phrases 
want to have specific things in their complement slots for up you need to have a noun phrase there like up the hill um, the up in the build case runs uh, behaves differently because it's actually um, not a preposition it's part of this verb so you can't say up the bill ran Jack and Jill but you can say Jack and Jill ran the bill up it's the opposite case of what we saw before so here it's a particle not a preposition it's part of this verb and it's a weird part because you can move it to the end of the sentence like in jack and jill ran the bill up but up the bill is not a constituent by itself here because up is actually attached to this run so if you try to split it off um, in the front it's not going to work the run has to come before the up in the sentence um, and it turns out for whatever random reason uh, in english it's okay to end a sentence with one of these particles you can move that to the end um, but you can't move it to the front uh, okay so that's more of a quick write about trying to identify where the uh, sort of phrase structure is in the sentence more than anything else we're not going to dwell on this sort of structure uh, very much and I don't even know if, how much syntacticians have dwelt on it um, to be uh, honest because um, they <laughs> kind of address easier problems than that uh, be that as it may I want to kind of talk a little bit about how English is unique syntactically in the world of syntax and how other languages might differ. Um, so uh, to kind of set the stage for this, I'll say that uh, over time, people have identified language universals or there's universal patterns that we see in syntax uh, across all languages. So all languages uh, will have phrases with heads and complements, like we've seen for syntactic trees in English. All languages will have lexical categories like nouns and verbs. All languages can exhibit infinite recursion. Uh, although there's a, one or two kind of interestingly controversial cases where people aren't entirely sure, but basically all around the world, no matter what language you speak, you have features like this in your syntax, no matter what. This is just part of what it means to be human, basically, because this information is part of our universal grammar. It's what we get kind of for free as just human beings um, because we have a specific module in our head, which is devoted to acquiring language. So children do not need to learn these aspects of grammar from the language they're hearing out in the world. They're going to get them no matter what, just by virtue of being human effectively and having the faculty of language inside their minds. Uh, languages, however, can still differ syntactically within these universal limits. So uh, there are differences between languages syntactically, and you've probably encountered these if you've ever had to learn a second language, right? So one which is kind of easy to describe now, given the terminology we've been developing, is uh, that some languages can be head first and some languages can be head final. Uh, so we've seen before each phrase, like a noun phrase, a verb phrase, so on and so forth, has a head. If it's a noun phrase, it has a noun for a head. If it's a verb phrase, it has a verb for a head. If you, if you are speaking a language like English, you're speaking a head-first language. And in that case, the head of the phrase is going to precede any complements it might have. Uh, so I'll give you some examples, like a verb uh, phrase will be headed by that verb, and then uh, the noun phrase will be after that, right? So kick the ball, so on and so forth. We saw this with the um, uh, prepositional phrase a second ago, so like up the hill. The head of the phrase comes first and then the complement after it. And it kind of doesn't matter what kind of phrase you're dealing with, whether it's a verb phrase, a noun phrase, prepositional phrase, so on and so forth. The head is going to come first and the complement after. So these are this is how you can express those rules, uh, those phrase structure rules in very general terms, uh, where x and y are just variables. Um, we can look at the other case, though, where we have a head final language. Uh, and a nice example of this is Japanese. Not to keep going back to Japanese, but uh, it um, kind of offers some nice compliments to English uh, in a lot of cases. And one is in its syntax. So in uh, Japanese, the head of the phrase is going to follow its complements. So um, in general, we'll see a pattern where x bar goes to first the complement, yp, and then the head at the end, x. So I can give you an example here of the prepositional phrase um, in the garden. <coughs> and in this case, what you say in Japanese is you say the garden first, because that's the complement, and then the preposition last uh, in. So niwade, I don't really speak Japanese, but I'll try, um, means garden in, uh, or that's how you literally transcribe it in the same syntactic order. But what it actually means if you translate it is in the garden. Um, yeah, I'm just going to mention again that this is um, 
again, another reason why we kind of have um, this X bar structure in our phrase structure is because there are things going on at this level between the heads and their complements, which we don't see necessarily for the specifiers in the phrase, which are at a higher level um, of connection, basically. Uh, I'll also point out that when you do have a language like Japanese, where um, say the preposition comes after the noun that uh, is its complement, uh, those languages are called, uh, the prepositions in those languages are called postpositions because they're happening, the position is after the noun rather than before, like in English. Um, so uh, sentences in head final languages will usually follow the pattern subject, object, verb. Um, so you can kind of stop to think about this, or I'll give you a few examples to kind of make it clear. Uh, but it's inverting this usual order that we see in English. So normally um, we get subject, verb, object uh, in English. So like the boy kicked the ball, or the boy verb kicked the ball. Object comes after the verb. Uh, in a language like Japanese, it's going to be the opposite, like the boy the ball kicked. Uh, or I'll give you another example here, a uh, canned example. So Taro ga ino, ino mitsukita, like I said, don't actually speak Japanese, but this means taro and ga is a subject marker, so we know that's a subject. Dog, object marker, oh, found. So taro, dog, found, means taro found a dog. Um, the object comes before the verb. I'll give you another example. Um, and actually, I'll point out here as well. So this is the specifier of our tense phrase at the highest level. Sorry, I've got something in my eye. Um, and this is the verb phrase uh, down at a lower level. So the um, positioning of the specifier doesn't change, uh, but the order of the verb and its complement changes in that um, verb phrase um, further on down in the structure of the sentence. So we get that noun phrase complement, and then we get the verb. That's the only thing switching order. Uh, we could also say inuga niwa de ason de iru. Uh, so dog is the subject, garden in, we've seen that structure before, playing is, dog garden in, playing is, is how you say the dog is playing in the garden in Japanese. So we see, we see here the, well, yeah, first of all, the specifier of the TP doesn't change its position. The noun phrase subject is still there. Uh, the order of the preposition and its complement does change, so that comes last. Playing, this is the head of the verb phrase that comes before its prepositional phrase complement. Is is the uh, verb filling that tense slot, the auxiliary verb here. That comes after its verb phrase complement, which is garden in playing. Yeah, so the dog is playing in the garden. You keep switching the order of everything. It's consistent, which is nice, even though it's maybe a bit hard to wrap your head around all the backwardness if you're not used to it. Okay, so uh, if you think about it, uh, we have a subject, like a classical sentence will have subject, verb, object, the boy kicked the ball, um, and there are six different possible orders for subject, verbs, and objects in a sentence. Um, and there, all six orders have been attested to in at least one of the world's languages, although there's definitely um, patterns in which some are more common than others. So the most common of these orders is actually the Japanese order. So 44% of the world's languages are SOV languages or subject, object, verb languages. Uh, so this is what we see in Japanese, in Korean as well, in Turkish. Some people, so I'll make an aside here, uh, and the Japanese and Korean are typically classified as uh, language isolates, which, mean, which means that um, they don't seem to be related historically to any of the other languages in the world, although some people have tried to relate them to one another, and also some people have tried to relate, to relate them to languages like Turkish uh, without um, much success. But this is one thing that those languages actually do have in common. 35% um, of the world's languages are like English, that are subject for object languages or SVO languages, so English, French, Chinese, so on and so forth. That takes care of the lion's share of these of the languages of the world, but there's still all four other orders attested in some parts. Like 19% um, of the world's languages are VSO languages, which mean verb, subject, object languages. So rather than the boy kicked the ball or the boy the ball kicked, you say kicked the boy the ball in languages like Air Irish, Arabic, and Welsh. Um, Moving right on down the line, there's still a very small sliver of percent of the world's languages which are VOS languages. So these are verb, object, sub subject languages. Instead of the boy kicked the ball, you would say kicked the ball the boy, um, which, yeah, might take a while to wrap your head around. But this is how you say that a sentence in Aramaic, which is spoken in the Middle East or Hawaiian, 
Tagalog and Maori, so on and so forth. Um, and then there's two very rare language types, which are the OSB languages. Uh, and I kind of had to dig around to find examples of these. Uh, one is called Havante and another is Hamamadi, and they're spoken in Brazil. So instead of the boy kicked the ball, you would say the ball, the boy kicked. And then the least common language type of all is OVS, object, verb, subject, which is the exact opposite of the English order. So in this case, instead of the boy kicked the ball, you'd say the boy, sorry, instead of the boy kicked the ball, you'd say the ball kicked the boy, which seems like it's saying the exact opposite of what we would say. But that's how it works in languages like Guajarijo and Hikariana, which is also spoken in Brazil. Uh, so the possibilities are out there. They're just hard to find. Uh, and I also mentioned that another object verb subject language is Klingon, uh, which was designed as such because the idea was to make it sort of like the least um, naturally human language uh, possible because it's a made up language just for the um, TV show Star Trek and the movie series as well. Uh, I guess the universe now, um, the TV universe, you might say, by this time. Um, I don't think I've mentioned this story before, uh, but um, in the 90s, uh, there was actually some guy, uh, coincidentally from uh, Minnesota, who decided that he would try to just speak Klingon as much as possible after he had, his wife had given birth to their first child um, to see if the kid would actually start to pick up Klingon. Um, and uh, he apparently kept at this for a long time, uh, and to a certain extent it was working and that the kid could understand what he was saying, but uh, evidently the kid figured out eventually that nobody else in the world was speaking Klingon, so uh, didn't really start speaking it himself in any meaningful way. Uh, and at that point, the, um, the Star Trek fan just gave up on the project and realized that maybe this was not the wisest way to raise a child. Um, but, you know, linguistics makes lots of, lots of things possible. Um, anyways, uh, there's also another option, which is to have what's called free word order or scrambling. And I've got some examples of this from a language called Yerbal, which is spoken in Australia. Uh, and I have a note here that's spoken by about five people. I'm not sure if that's still true. These, um, a lot of these languages with these rare word orders are uh, endangered and um, are in great likelihood of disappearing in the near future. Uh, so Yerbal is an Aboriginal Australian language. Uh, and that means that you can just, uh, and it's scrambling, uh, which means that you can just put the words in any order and then your listener will figure out what you're saying. Uh, and what makes this possible is that it has case marking of nouns, so like inflectional affixes basically, uh, so you can figure out what's going on. And I kind of apologize for these examples, but they're the only ones I could find in the, uh, the source I had on this language. So uh, the um, sentence, the man hit the woman, um, is bangu jarungu balan jukumbil bagan in durable. Uh, and a lot of these words or morphemes are just kind of markers to tell you what's going on. So uh, when you boil it down, Jara is man, Jukumbil is woman, and hit is Balgan. So man, woman, hit. You can say it that way. Erg means it's an ergative, means it's making something happen. Uh, the object um, morpheme here, uh, it's labeled two. Uh, this is a um, language that has lots of different noun classes. So every noun has to kind of fit into a different class or form of nouns. Um, sort of like if you studied, say, French, um, every noun has to be either masculine or feminine. It works similar here, except there's more than just two or three um, noun classes. There's a lot. Uh, and anyways, this helps mark what noun is an object or a subject. Uh, and you can say the same thing in an entirely different way. So balan, jukumbil, bangu, jarangu, balgan. Uh, means woman or well the order is woman man hit but it means the same thing the man hit the woman and you can figure it out by figure that out by just kind of relying on these affixes or noun class markers um, where they appear in the sentence I've also got the dingo took her baby another unfortunate sentence but it's bangun gani baragu buding bangun gujara uh, which um, is dingo take baby so this is an example of subject verb object so we've got at least three here and they can use the others too as well if they want Okay, so not everything is as tightly coordinated and structured as English is syntactically speaking. Uh, so this leads me to Yodish, and uh, hopefully you did the quick write. Uh, and if you did, now is your chance to try to answer the question of what sort of language does Yoda speak? And I think I'm actually going to pause here uh, and give you a moment to think about before I start the next video.